All right, I am very excited to introduce my next guest. I'm speaking with Joyce Ray. Uh, Joyce is a Beverly Hills-based luxury real estate agent who, who heads uh, the global luxury division for Coldwell Banker. She's considered one of the most successful real estate agents in all of the U.S. Uh, she's one of the most respected names in top-tier real estate worldwide. Uh, she's amassed more than $5 billion with a B in sales. Uh, among her most recent accolades, Joyce is designated one of the Los Angeles 500 most influential people by the LA Business Journal, uh, named the first lady of luxury real estate by the Chinese media, described as the billionaire's broker by the Hollywood Reporter. Um, and in 2019, Ray Joyce had a, a record-breaking year, including the sale of the Perinchio Estate the most expensive property exclusively listed in the U.S. So a lot of accolades there, Joyce. Uh, pleasure to have you on. Welcome to the Top Agent Podcast. Well, I'm really thrilled to be included. Thank you for inviting me. Awesome. So first off, I just want to say like huge congratulations on all of your successes. Um, most notably, I think you recently passed the, the five billion in sales mark. Is that right. correct? That is correct. Amazing. So I'm very curious, like after even hitting like the 1 billion mark, like what was that moment like, uh, you know, was it like a, a short term celebration and then sort of back to the drawing board and, you know, let's get to 2 billion and three and four and five. Like, what was that mindset like? I, I don't know that I was thinking necessarily at 1 billion about more billions. <laughs> but, and I, I have a tendency to, um, to try to focus on the future as opposed to looking back. And it's very exciting to hit a particular goal or particular landmark. But, uh, you know, our business is, is a very demanding and exciting business and it requires constant innovation. So it's, it's, it's so important to be focused on the future. So as much as those achievements are exciting, it's, I wanna do better and do more. And that's kind of our focus. I think that's a similar like mindset to a lot of like successful entrepreneurs and business people. Like there's never a, like a cap or a ceiling. So it's always just growing and better and provide more value to people. What it's all about. And improving and making this world a better place is a big part of my goal in life. So there are a lot of things in the works. Nice. Very exciting. Uh, so can you, for those who don't know you or your background, can you tell us just a bit about yourself and how, how you got into real estate? Well, actually it was accidental. Um, I, I, st I actually, well, and it actually began with tragedy. I lost my father in uh, the first few weeks of my freshman year at USC, suddenly of a heart attack. Mm -hmm. At that point in life, I knew absolutely had no idea what I wanted to do. And um, I then decided that I would have to support myself and I needed to do something practical. So I became a business major with a minor in education because back when I was at USC in the 60s, uh, you know, teachers became school teachers or dental hygienists. It was kind of those two career paths. And I found that there was a major at the university that combined business and education and I could get a, a secondary teaching credential within five years because they were short of business, business teachers in the local high schools and throughout California. So that kind of prompted me into the business world. And, and at that time, there were only five women in the entire business school at USC. So uh, it, was, it was a route that I kind of started early and then uh, I went on to become a teacher. I was teaching uh, business law and business English in South Central Los Angeles. Um, when I met and married my husband, who was uh, an actor, a well-known actor, Alejandro Ray. And the minute we got married, he had a movie in Brazil. And uh, I figured it wasn't a good idea to let my handsome Latin husband march off to Brazil without me. So uh, I gave up my teaching career and went to Brazil with him. So, um, and after that, um, we bought and sold a couple of houses. And I loved the process. I loved house hunting. And I kind of studied for my real estate license on a lark, thinking I should know more about this, what, what we're doing, this process. 
And then a friend said, oh, you'd make a great realtor. Why don't you hang your license as long as you studied it, et cetera. And the rest is history. That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, so j just for context, I, I know you're in a, a you know very high end luxury market, but how many transactions or, or sales volume do you do in a given year on average? Well, uh, you know, I never really count the, tr the number of transactions because the average size of what my transaction is fairly high. So I don't have a huge volume. I have more focus on and, and in particular, when you're in luxury real estate here on the west side of Los Angeles, clients can look for houses for years. I had one client, several clients that I worked 10 years with before I sold them a house. So uh, people don't realize how much work and effort can go into selling luxury properties. And also, when you look at some of the, uh, the, the big deals that are made, many of these properties are on the market for many years before they sell. And for, for some time, perhaps on a confidential level, then they're heavily marketed or sometimes properties, very expensive properties, never actually publicly marketed. So, uh, you know, it's it, it's an interesting business. So it's it's hard to tell you the number of transactions and your volume can vary because you make one deal at 70, 80 million and that boosts up your numbers for the year. And then one year, maybe you don't make one a great big deal like that. And so your numbers are lower. So it's, it's, it, it's a little misleading. Yeah, your, makes, your makes complete sense. Yeah. Uh, it, so in, in 2019, uh, the, the you know, record breaking sale price uh, in the U.S., is that still the record today? Uh, no, <laughs> actually, it was it was the record for four months. <laughs> Uh, Jeff Bezos came along and beat it by, by uh, 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 not a big figure. He paid uh, 15 million more than than we sold that property for. So now it's the the second highest sale in California. You know, to get to to the level you're at, you know, five billion in sales. You know, you obviously don't get there, you know, by being lucky. So. I'm very curious to hear from you. What are what are the three things, like two or three things, you do each and every day to help you, you know, achieve your goals or, or help you get closer to your targets? Like, do you have any daily uh, rituals or, or things you do consistently? You know, one of the things I like about real estate is the fact that each day is different. Uh, the one thing that I try to do pretty religiously is organ, organize myself the night before. Look carefully at my calendar, what's in store. Uh, think about uh, p calls I need to make, uh, situations I need to set up, people I need to connect with so that I have my to-do list every day. So that's kind of a base. And then I move from there. There's a real estate, there, there are so many things happening at all times with uh, appointments changing, uh, new properties coming on the market. Uh, so and and so you can't really be too structured. You've got to be flexible. You have to be able to kind of move with your clients and what's going on. And if you have an important client, maybe you have to spend a good portion of the day just focused on them. So. Uh, and, and you have to be available. You have to be available to your colleagues and to your clients. So, um, you know, you have to be kind of alert and on it all day long and, and part of the night as well. Yeah, absolutely. I can only imagine. So, you know, so you work in, you know, Beverly Hills area. Um, you know, it's probably, like, it's like the Mecca of luxury real estate, you can say. So, I'm very curious, like, how did you tap into that market? Like, was it always your intention or, or did it sort of find you in a way? Actually, it was, again, kind of accidental. Uh, my husband knew uh, a, a woman who was working in real estate in Beverly Hills, and he suggested I, I contact her because when you get your real estate license, you have to hang it somewhere. And so uh, I called her. She was ch a wonderful, charming woman who had been an actress and become a realtor. And she was a lot of fun. She was Italian, had a great personality. Her name was Letitia. 
her acting name is Letitia Rome and her, her married name is Letitia Gellis. And so I hung my license in her firm. And it turned out that she worked with a wonderful firm here in Beverly Hills. Uh, the name was Jack Hupp and Associates. And he was my original mentor and teacher. And he, he was an amazing human being. He was, well, first of all, he wrote the code of ethics for the Beverly Hills Realty Board. He was a basketball star from USC, which was my university. Uh, he was married to Marie Windsor, who made movies with Ronald Reagan. And he, uh, he was the kindest, most generous uh, uh, person. And I loved, I mean, he taught me everything I know about real estate. So uh, he's not around today, but I, I, I love the years I worked with him. And, and after I worked with him, I had the opportunity to start the first company in the world only to handle million dollar houses. And that was an exciting, exciting run. And because in 1978, I doubled the highest price that anyone had paid for a house in the United States. And that back in that day, we didn't have social media. We didn't have 24 hour news cycle. You know, it wasn't such a big deal. People didn't even know that I'd done that. And, um, but the local market knew it. And so one of the biggest agents in town with the biggest company in town came to me and said, we have this idea and we need you to start it, run it, do it. And it was an exciting idea. And of course that made world headlines when, oh, there's a firm that's only handling houses for a million dollars in 19. It sounds ridiculous now, but in 1979, that was unbelievable. That's interesting. So, okay. That's, that's an interesting story. Um, so is that it was that foreign for, for a, a firm to just focus on, you know, million dollar plus properties back then? It was really unheard of. And of course, we really didn't even have an international market. I back then, I don't even recall ever meeting a foreign buyer. I mean, you know, we just didn't have an influx of foreign money or clientele. It's the market has changed so dramatically. Yeah, I'd imagine. Um, and more so now, like how are, how's your market where you work in now, like during like COVID and this crazy situation, what's the impact been on, on the, the market in Beverly Hills? Well, it, it's really surprising. Uh, the, 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 initially, of course, a year ago when it happened, we felt that we would never be able to sell a house again. Um, and of course it was short lived because the reverse happened because everyone was focused and staying in their home all day long the home became the most important thing in people's lives. And so all of a the sudden they wanted to move up or out or wherever they could to improve their environment. And so the real estate market has flourished during this time, particularly the luxury market because people who could afford it, which was a small segment, but a big part of the luxury market here wanted to move up. So are, are you noticing, uh, an influx in or out? Is it sort of the same balanced? Uh, I, a lot of people are suggesting that people are moving out of big cities and into suburbs. And I think that's true to some extent, but we have a very short inventory. I have the lowest number of listings probably that I've ever had in my career. The, the people, we simply don't have enough houses to sell. Uh, there are, we have a seller's market. The buyers cannot find what they want. And so the pressure on the prices as a result. For sure. Yeah. It seems to be a common trend with, with, you know, in every market and realtors I speak to, um, I spoke to a, a really big agent in Atlanta, uh, yesterday and she, she's been in the business 40 years. She says she's never experienced or seen a market this hot in her entire career. So similar uh, sentiments everywhere it seems like yes it is the, the the real estate market in fact i just read that uh prices are up january i think year over year 10 percent nationwide yeah. yeah where i am i'm in toronto canada uh they just released uh for for the month uh 15 percent year over year so it's uh yeah crazy stuff so switching gears a little bit like i'd imagine you know, relationships and, you know, relationship nurturing is very important, you know, especially in your luxury niche that, you, that you're working in. So 
curious to hear from you. What are some of the ways you continue to nurture and build your relationships with clients, past clients, or even uh, prospects? Well, I, there's not enough hours in the day for me to nourish those relationships. There, I've met so many wonderful people in my career, and I, I don't, I, I just, I love spending time with them. Uh, I just received a phone call this morning from some people that I have known for 40 years, even longer, 45 years. They want to have dinner with me. And, you know, we set a date. Now, of course, things are opening up and we have dinner out of doors and we're able to go out. And, and so many of my friends have been vaccinated, which is a, another level of security, uh, but which is great because during this time of being sheltered and secluded, we, we, we weren't socializing as much and I really missed it because uh, my life has always been about my friendships and my work is my passion. And, um, you know, it's, it, I, uh, before I was a realtor, I kind of operated that way. I always had a wide circle of friends. I love being with my friends. In fact, that was one of the arguments I used to have with my husband. He loved to stay home and I wanted to go out. <laughs> that's, that's interesting. So, so yeah, you've been in the business now so long, uh, built you know a lot of relationships and clients over the years. Like, do you have any like systems in place to help you you know engage and keep in touch with people, or is it very much just a personal thing that you do? No, I try to I, I try to improve my systems. Um, one of the things that I've done over the years, and actually I didn't do this year, and I because I just felt it wasn't practical in COVID times. And I thought we were having such trouble with the mails that it didn't make sense. But I normally send out thousands of Christmas cards and I spend a lot of effort. I co-chair UNICEF USA in Southern California, and I donate a lot of money to UNICEF and I've been on the executive board for, uh, oh gosh, I think almost 14 years. Uh, but I normally send out a UNICEF Christmas card so I'm donating to UNICEF. And in addition, I usually include some kind of a photograph from the year that is something interesting that happened. And then I come up with some kind of a special saying or quote. And so that it, the, the, the Christmas card is, is a personal way to stay in contact with the many, many wonderful people that I've met in my business, both my colleagues and my clients. So uh, that and I didn't do it this year because of the mails and because of COVID and you know we were all of us working from home and it was just more complicated to send out 2,000 Christmas cards but and then I also try to remember my friends and clients birthdays and um, and that's a way that I kind of stay in contact with people and then seeing them regularly and having dinner with them or going somewhere with them uh, I love the theater I love sports I'm a big Clipper fan uh, I'm going against the wave here in LA, but I've always rooted for the underdog. And one of these days, the Clippers are going to be NBA champs, maybe this year. <laughs> you know what? It was, it was disappointing last year. I, I like the Clippers too, because you guys have uh, Kawhi now, who is with the Raptors, and he won us a championship. So, um, yeah. He's wonderful. He's just wonderful. Yeah, that's my guy for sure. Uh, yeah. What about. Um, how much of your day spent is spent, you know, just speaking, picking up the phone, texting clients? Like, is that really like an embedded part of your day today? Huge part of the day. I, the texts, the texts, of course, are immediate and it is a big part of my day. And not only that, I'm, I, I, I personally have always liked phone calls uh, because I feel a text and an email is a little impersonal. When you're on the phone, there's more back and forth. You can question, you can really get to the bottom of the things. But what I've found in particular is your generation, the millennial, you know, all of these younger people don't like the phone in general. They will always email. And I find that's a delayed reaction because you'll send an email and somebody may not answer for four or five hours. If you call and you get them on the phone, you get an immediate answer. And there's always, I've found one of the most important things in my business is the sense of urgency. And you must, I mean, clients want answers now. They don't want to wait till tomorrow. So, you know, you need to get things done and done quickly. So 
I, I, I favor the telephone. It's interesting, isn't it, about how you're right, millennials, the younger generation, they prefer, you know, not to get on the phone. Like, why do you think that is? Any any ideas? I don't know. And, and I worry about it because I feel that, that you know, personal empathy is an important part of life and business, particularly the real estate business and relationships. And when you're texting and emailing and having no personal connect, it, it removes an, an important part of life, which is, you know, the huma humanity. We're people here. We're, we're, we yeah. need to hear what you have to say. Totally. Do, do you use technology in a way to sort of support that? Like, for example, you know, you, you mentioned you sent thousands of, of cards and you, you know so many people. Do you have like any reminders in place to help you with special dates with, with people or things like that, in, like with your systems and your processes? Well, my, yes, I, well, I have calendars and I try to put everything, you know, as much as possible onto the calendar. So I'm reminded to do this or reminded to do that with particular clients or particular follow up. And, um, uh, and then I find myself also, I have a team, not only do I head the luxury division for Coal Banker, but I also have a personal team of agents that work under me. So you know, we partner on, so I also am spending part of my day reminding them of things. And then I have a fantastic staff of five that, that work just for me. Nice. Okay. Awesome. So I'm curious to, to know as well. So, you know, we talked about like nurturing and, you know, and building those yeah. existing relationships. What about new contacts? You know, I've sp spoken to some others who work in, in luxury markets and, I find a common avenue for them are like holding events, for example. Uh, what are some things like you're doing to be front of mind to attract new clients and build these relationships, new relationships? Well, I, because I am involved in a lot of charities, I do in normal times attend a lot of events because, uh, uh, either because a client of mine is involved, many of my clients or most of my clients are involved in charities and I like to support those. And, uh, <clears throat> and then I myself uh, contribute to a number of charities that I feel strongly about. So, um, you know, I don't have to organize the events, someone else is doing them for the most part. But I, I have, one of my favorite things has been over the years is to throw a big holiday party. And, you know, I tent my backyard and I used to be in the old days, my housekeeper would cook about three or four turkeys. And she was famous for being the best turkey maker in town. And uh, we'd have, you know, and we'd have a lot of people, uh, two friends of mine met at my Christmas party and they've been together for 10 years. I'm very proud of that. Uh, so, uh, I suppose that's, but I, you know, those aren't things I've done for business. I've really done it because I love celebrating the holidays and I love having all my friends over and my, my circle of friends gets bigger and bigger. Uh, and they, and my parties get more and more crowded. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully this year you can throw a, a big bash to make up for it. I hope so. <laughs> What about, so, so that's interesting. You know, I like what you said there. It's not for business, just like you enjoy, you know, your friends and your company. Are there, are there any things you do at this point, like for business, for the purpose of like being more strategic and like opening up a, a new sphere of influence or new you know channels, or are you sort of past that at this stage in your business? Well, you know, I've, over the years I have, I've done different things like, for instance, oh my gosh, I was the first agent to go to China or certainly one of the first. Um, I kind of saw back in the 80s that we had a big amount of people coming in from China. That's where that quote came from. And I was spent several weeks in China. I had a uh, press conference with all the top Chinese press. I threw a huge event at an art gallery where I projected my listings all on the walls of the art gallery. Um, and, and that resulted in several sales, a result of that trip. So, you know, I, I think you have to always think about other things that you can do to bring in business and, you know, traveling can, can be very helpful. Meeting, meeting new people, making new contacts. Our company, 
uh, is worldwide. So when I travel, I can throw in a little business. I can stop at our office offices in Italy, or I can stop at when I went to China. We had a hundred offices there at the time, and I spoke at an office opening. So, you know, that enables me to have a world profile that most agents don't have. They may join a company that has those, but they haven't been there. They haven't gone there. I've been to Dubai. I spoke at our Cobo Banker office in Dubai. So, you know, th this, is, this is important that you are constantly connecting with people everywhere. For sure. Yeah, that, that definitely goes without saying. So I, I'm curious to to hear then, um, you know, given travel and that, how have how things changed for your business specifically now, like in this COVID time we're in? Well, certain properties have have suffered, I feel, because they particularly attract a foreign client. And of course, it's been very difficult. We have received a number of inquiries from overseas of people that are interested, but they can't get here. So, you know, I'm kind of waiting. Um, it's, it, it, you know, everyone has a different projection on what's going to happen. But um, the uh, uh, Bill Gates said, we'll be almost back to normal in the fall. Uh, and the Los Angeles Times has said they felt the summer will be pretty normal. So, uh, and, and the president, I believe, said today, uh, President Biden said that by May, uh, there'll be enough vaccine for everyone in the United States. So, you know, it's looking very favorable that we will be able to open up and, and people will be relieved um, and not, I mean, it's been a terrible worry for people. I was just with someone this morning whose mother was in the hospital for three months with COVID. Fortunately, she's gotten out, but. Can you imagine the worry and concern in that family? Yeah, well, things are, are definitely seeming to be, you know, a lot of positive news <laughs> happening now. Things seem to be optimistic. So, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, you know, we're all hoping for, for that outcome and we can start enjoying uh, a lot of the little things that you almost take for granted. So fingers crossed, I suppose. Um, another a curious question here. So. You know, we talked about like, you know, marketing, nurturing, things like that. I think that's half the battle. So what about the actual sale itself? You know, at the end of the day, you have to execute and deliver on the service you're offering. And that's, you know, selling a client's home, let's say. So how do you differentiate your listings from the, you know, dozens of other luxury listings in your community? Well, I like to think that I do more than everyone else. Um, I, I do a few things that are special. First of all, Cobo Banker has a fabulous, in the Los Angeles Times, once each month, there's a whole magazine of Cobo Banker listings in color, it, basically from all over Southern California that are in, it's called The View. And so we have that, no one else has that. So uh, I, I advertise extensively in there. Uh, I also do my own personal insert of my listings once a month into the Los Angeles Times. Uh, most other agents do not do that. Uh, I also create a magazine and send it to the wealthiest people in Los Angeles to their homes, which is a lifestyle magazine, but includes only my listings. So I do a lot of things that other agents do not do. And, um, uh, I have obviously, because I've been in the business now for over 45 years, I have a huge database of both my colleagues, the top colleagues, as well as my clientele. So uh, I, I send out a newsletter to let people know what I'm doing, what's going on in the business. I have a blog, a lifestyle blog um, that I love people to uh, just go on my my. Uh, JoyceRay.com, and you can go uh, have access to my blog. Um, I love doing anything that's interesting and fun on my blog. And uh, so uh, I have a lot of things that I'm busy with. Let's put it that way. Yeah, for sure. So I, I like that magazine. So the, is this like a monthly magazine you do, or do you just uh, send it out no, when I you have? Quarterly. Quarterly. Okay. That's awesome. 
All right, that's that's. Cool. What about the actual, um, like you know, photography, videography? Are you doing any anything? Um... Oh, absolutely. that's an automatic. Uh, we you know we do that. Well, we did that even before COVID. I would a video was you know has been very important part of our marketing for for many years now. So yes, we take videos. We use the drone photography, which enhances one's ability to see a property um so yes all of that we do the the we do the matterport tours although i have always kind of preferred the video over the matterport but uh because i feel like you can really make the house look better in the matterport it's a little limited how the house looks um but we've done we've done a lot of that um but you know, obviously people in general, because they're timid about going in and looking at houses, they do a lot more searching online than was the case a year ago. That That's what I'm getting at. I think uh, just like even like the quality of the photos and in, in, in the videography are probably more important now than ever to really oh, uh, focus on quality that. quality is extremely important, uh, you know, and that and the quality, I mean, there's a big difference in, in, in terms of the pricing the, you know, the really fine photographers are very expensive. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm always curious to ask this as well, because I've heard some unique answers, but do you do anything uh, special or unique or you can share some, some uh, stories maybe of, of uh, unique gifts or things you do for clients after closing a, you know, multi-million dollar property, anything like that? Well, I sometimes I, I don't know that I do anything that fabulous. It depends, of course, on the buyer, how well I know them. You know, it, it, it I mean, so it varies. But, you know, I always like a Tiffany key ring. Nice. Yeah. You know, which yeah. nowadays facial recognition, the keys may be out. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. But, That's very uh, true. Uh, and often, you know, often a bottle of Dom Perignon so we can go to Tiffany's and get a couple of flutes and, and a, and a key ring and, and people usually love that. They yeah, no, love that, that. that's awesome. That's great. That's very nice. Um, so you, you, you know, you close, you know, several deals a year uh, over decades, you know, I'm sure every deal is obviously very different uh, that goes without saying uh, and, and some maybe come with unique sets of challenges perhaps do you have any examples of a deal that maybe stood out that, that you know not non-traditional uh like maybe a hurdle you had to overcome any any story or anything like that well i've got a lot of stories <laughs> <laughs> but my favorite and one that everybody loves is uh, my shelly winner's story and you may be too young to remember Shelley Winters, but she was an actress back when I was beginning in the real estate business. And at one point she was a glamorous ingenue, but at the time I was showing her, she put on a lot of weight and she was about several hundred pounds. And we were looking, and I was a young agent, and uh, we were looking at a house and she had a big moo on. And we walked out towards the pool <clears throat> And she pulled off her mumu. She had nothing on underneath and she dove in the swimming pool. Uh, and the male real estate agent representing the house was kind of horrified. And, and he dropped his jaw and I said, don't just stand there, go get a towel. So she's swimming in the pool and she gets out and, and she says, you know, I'm going to make an offer. So I said, great. Uh, so I run to the office in those days we, we wrote up offers on typewriters. You probably don't even know what an old typewriter is like. And I'm in the office typing this offer for Shelly. And at that time she was, you know, very famous. And um, an old time realtor walked in the office and said, what are you doing? Oh, I said, I'm so excited. I'm typing an offer for Shelly Winters. And she said, Shelly Winters? Why, she's the biggest looky-loo in the industry. And I said, really? And of course I was a new agent. I didn't know she'd been looking for a house for 30 years. So uh, the phone rings and it's Shelly. And um, she's on the phone. She said, Joyce, I'm not sure if I wanna make the offer. And normally I would say, okay, you know, we'll look elsewhere. But I said, 
well, your offer's so low, they're probably not going to take it anyway. So she says, okay. So I get it signed and I go to the business manager to present the offer. And he says, this offer is low. And I said, you're right. It's a low offer. I said, but if you want to sell this house now to Shelly, you won't counter offer. You will sign this offer. So he signed the offer. I sold her the house. And about five years later, she calls me up and she says, Joyce, I want you to come over to the house. Well, I said, great. I'd love to see you, Shelly. So I go over there. She's written a bestseller book called Shelly. And it's her life story. And it's on the best, number one on the bestseller list, right? So she writes in the book to Joyce, who sold me the house that gave me the peace of mind to write this book. Wow. That is really cool. That's amazing. So that is one of my really favorite stories. Not must, only. The, yeah. Wow. So the book. <laughs> That's amazing. You must have been really uh, surprised to, to see that, I'd imagine. Yes. Yes. I, I really incredible. was. I say so much about if that woman hadn't walked in the office while I was typing the offer, you know, I, it probably wouldn't have happened. So that so much of life is, is uh, the luck of the draw. Totally. That, that's a great story. Thanks for sharing that one. Um, so J Joyce, if you had to give, you know, with all of your experience and, and insights and, and, and everything you've accomplished, if you had to give one piece of advice to, let's say a brand new agent, uh, or even an agent that's looking to really, you know, elevate their game. Like, what would that piece of advice be? Well, in any profession, and in particular in the real estate business, you have to really be committed to it. You have to be passionate. You, it's not, uh, often people join our industry because they think of it as kind of part-time, that they can do it here or do it there. You, you can't be part-time. It's, it's become more and more competitive, more and more demanding. You're constantly learning. That's the best part of our business is it, you're in a constant learning situation. What, how can I learn from my mistakes? How can I improve? How can I be better? But you'll see it, Steve Jobs called it. You must love what you do. Then it's not work. You know, yes, you're working morning, noon and night, but you want to do it. You care about it. You, you can't wait to get to it. And that's the key. That's the key to anything. And if you're happy in life, you end up in a business that you love. Couldn't agree more. Um, yeah, you know, when you do something and it doesn't feel like work, I mean, what greater thing in life is that? That's. I bet that's... you feel like that about what you're doing. I mean, you meet a lot of interesting people. You learn a lot from what you do. Um, Absolutely, you know, yeah. You Absolutely. have a good profession. Yeah, very good advice for sure. Uh, Joyce, I do want to be mindful of your time. I, I do end off each chat with what I call the top three. You ready? Top three, yes. Top what are three, those? all right. Number one, your top or, or favorite real estate or business book or even book in general. Well, I don't know that I read that many business books. Uh, right now, I'm in the midst of... Um, Sanjay Gupta's new book about how you can stay sharp. <laughs> One of which is to eat eat berries every day. <laughs> really, I was going to ask, like any uh, so berries, okay. Yeah, I'm supposed to eat berries every day, and we have to do different things, not do the same things. That you know, if you do a crossword puzzle every day, that's not helpful. You have to you have to mix it up. You have to do different things. Uh, anyway, it's, it's a in very interesting book, and I think he's terrific. But the, my favorite all-time book, and I went to look for it last night, actually, and I couldn't find it on my bookshelf. And I thought, I, and so I just reordered it. And it's, it's a book that was written many years ago by a wonderful motivational speaker uh, who, who I don't think is with us today. He passed away a few years ago. Uh, what, Dr. Wayne Dyer was his name. And he wrote a book called Wisdom of the Ages. And the book basically takes a famous uh, uh, paragraph or saying or something like Confucius or uh, a famous political leader or something. And they take this quote and then for a couple of pages, they apply it to our life. And it is the most interesting book. I absolutely love it. And I, I hadn't read it in a few years. And I thought to myself, 
And when I couldn't find it, uh, I thought to myself, I'm reordering it. I just reordered it yesterday. That sounds that sounds really interesting. I'm actually, I just pulled it up on Amazon. I think I'm going to order that as well. I think uh, you'd love it. because, And it's also nice because you can just read one before you go to sleep. Yeah, and yeah. It, it leaves you with something very inspirational. That's cool. I really uh, like that. Was, uh, number was, two. Oh, sorry. Was there another? I was just saying I thought the world of Wayne Dyer. Oh, yeah, no, I'm definitely gonna get to check that one out. Uh, number two, your favorite vacation spot. Well, that's a really hard one because I've been to so many wonderful places. So I'm gonna give you a few. Uh, one of my favorite vacations was was running with the bulls in Pam in um, in Spain. I wow. mean, that that was unbelievable. That must have been a thrill. Uh, yeah, in Pamplona. And, but the thing is, I wasn't running with the bulls in the street. I was on the balcony overlooking, pouring the champagne on the people that were. <laughs> and it was very exciting. And, and one of the places I loved, and it's so exotic, and I'd like to go back again, I haven't had a chance, is Marrakesh in Morocco. That's a very exotic. I mean, the snake charmers are there. It's like you're back in the 13th century in that souk. It's really exotic and interesting. And, um, and then, um, you know, I mean, I go to Italy every year. I belong to an organization called FI, Fundo Ambiente Italiano. And that's a group of Americans and Italians that support the cultural uh, project and restoration of the landmarks of Italy. And it's a wonderful group of people. We donate uh, uh, a lot of money so that these landmarks are preserved. And then we travel over there to see the work. And it's each, I mean, it's a trip like no other because you really have an inside view of the, of the homes and the gardens and the, it, it's, and you meet the most wonderful people. And that's that's very sounds, exciting. That sounds amazing. Do you have a favorite place in Italy? I don't know. It's, in Italy, there's so many great ones. Uh, it's hard to pick a favorite. Um, I love Terramina uh, in Sicily. Um, that was quite special. But and, and Puglia is one that not many people frequent, which I think is interesting. And, and this fall, we're hoping to go to Tuscany, which I love and, of course, I've been to before. Uh, but it, it's very hard to pick anything because I've I, I mean, who? You've got to be crazy if you don't love Italy. Yeah, I, I've been to Italy, and yeah, beautiful. And actually, yeah. I have on my my bucket list. I haven't been to Montreal, and I haven't been to um, Banff, and is it Lake Louise that's in Banff? Yeah, uh, Lake Louise. Yeah. I wanted to go to the Stampede in Calgary, yeah. so that is on my list. <laughs> you should yeah i'm I'm in toronto I, i've never been to alberta either actually that's on my list as well so but and I, uh you can tell i love traveling and yeah I no, for sure and i also love a spot in mexico called correas which is uh kind of a pride in central mexico on the coast and and that's where the polo grounds are and beautiful homes there and that's a, a gorgeous spot to visit too. I love that. Well, again, hopefully this year is the year to get back, uh, you know, on, on a jet and, and get going. So, and uh, lastly, Joyce, if you can go back, what's the one thing you wish you knew when you were just starting out in real estate? You know, I, I mean, when I started, I never dreamt that it would develop into you know, a lifelong passion. But I remember sitting in, in that office, that real estate office in those first few sales meetings and the people were talking about houses and neighborhoods and things that I didn't know. And, you know, I was so eager. I wanted to know it all right then. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know that there's anything, you know, I, I had a great background with my academics you know, and having a master's degree. Um, so I, I, you know, I don't know that there's anything. I mean, maybe the one thing would have been to start my own company. I had the opportunity uh, at one point, but when I had started this company, 
you know, that, that I mentioned mil with the million dollar houses and done all the work, I felt as if I had started. The difference was I didn't own it, unfortunately. So uh, I tried to get ownership uh, and they gave me a very lucrative contract, but it did not include ownership. And needless to say, they then sold what I built back then in the 80s. They sold it to Merrill Lynch. Merrill Lynch went into the real estate business for 10 years. And we were at that time owned by Merrill Lynch Realty. And then we were Prudential and now we're Coa Banker. So I've gone through all of these renovations basically with the same or alteration with the same. Company. So uh, but I haven't owned it. And, uh, you know, that's been maybe my one regret. And if I knew what I know now, I, I, I would have insisted on that ownership. Yeah, well, life's an experience and the experiences shape you. And, you know, it's one of those things where if, if one thing changed in the past, you know, you might not be where you are today. So um, very good. Joyce, thank you so much. I really do appreciate uh, you taking the time to speak with me. This was an incredible chat. I know so many people are going to get a lot of great value and insights uh, from this conversation. So. I really sincerely do appreciate it. Thank you so much. Well, I, I really appreciate being here. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Joyce. Have a good one. And hopefully we can do this again sometime. Great. That would be great. All right. Awesome. Take care.